Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today I want to talk about a very big topic, sex. I want to talk about why does God care about who you sleep with? Why does God care about your sex life? And I want to look at three major points. God, Number one, God's original design for sexuality. Number two, the lies of the culture surrounding sex. And number three, the sufficiency of God's grace concerning sex. But before we get into that, I just uh, want to make a couple announcements. Next week, we're going to have J.P. Moreland on, which is very exciting. He's a, a former professor of mine at Talbot, and he has a new book out on miracles. The book is so great and encouraging. I read it, and it's just like I was so excited, and it's uh, it's mind-blowing. So we're going to have him on next week. Also, as a reminder, there's a link below for Patreon. We're on Patreon now, and you can subscribe for as little as $5 a month. That would help out the show. And so, but let's dive into sex and why does God care about sex? Why does he care about your sex life, my sex life? And so first, the first point is God's original design for human sexuality. And obviously we get that at the very beginning in Genesis 2, 24, it says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So right away, the very beginning of God's word, we get God's design for human sexuality. One man, one woman, they become one flesh in marriage. And Jesus reiterates this in the gospels. In Matthew, he says, uh, the Pharisees come up to him and, and try to test him about divorce. They, they try to trap him and he answers and he says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, quote, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Once again, just the one flesh union between one man and one woman. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So again, Jesus reiterates the, the sexual mandate from the very beginning, from Genesis. He reiterates that in the Gospels, so there's no confusion about that. And then Paul reiterates it again in Ephesians chapter 5. Paul says, therefore, he goes back to Genesis and he says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Then he goes on to say, this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So Paul takes it to a whole nother level. It's not just human. It's not just on the human natural level. It's, it's a supernatural. It's on the supernatural level. And he relates human marriage to the marriage between Christ, who's the bride, the, the bridegroom and the church, who's the bride. And so human marriage really ultimately points to that old, that marriage in heaven between Christ and the church, be, between, between Christ and his bride. And so that just, uh, Paul just elevates it to, he takes it to the next level. And, and again, in, in Romans 1, we, we've, I've talked about this, talked about this on the last episode. Uh, anything outside of that design, anything, any sexual activity outside of that design between mon one man and one woman in a lifelong covenant of marriage is a suppression of the truth. And Paul says in Romans 1, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So all human beings suppress the truth. And then he goes on to say, For this, re for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So once again, Paul uses homosexual behavior as the example, 
as the illustration for suppressing the truth. And I, it's, I mean, this is a silly example, but it's, I mean, even Aristotle talked about this, about going against design of, uh, of nature, nature with a capital N. And Paul is talking about this as well in Romans 1. And it's like a fork is designed for a very specific reason. It's designed to eat. But if you use it, you know, for something else, then it can, it can cause great harm. So don't stick it in a, a, so in a socket, <laughs> an electrical outlet. Um, and then the next, so the next point I want to talk about is the lies of the culture surrounding sex. And I, you know, I talk about this a lot on the show, but I want to go through key turning points and I've done some of this, but I want to go comp comprehensively sort of through key turning points in the last 60 years of cultural indoctrination and, and uh, see how that has affected us and how we don't live in a vacuum. We, we are so, uh, we're so influenced by the culture. It's, I mean, obviously, even the church, the church is so deeply influenced by the culture. And we're seeing that all around us and we're seeing the breakdown of not only just humans, but we're seeing the breakdown of, of the church and Christians. So this all started in this country in the, in the 1960s, the sexual revolution began. And that's kind of when, you know, everything was like free love. Let's just let's, uh, you know, sex became m more of a commodity and it's like, let's just, we just want to satisfy our desires and we can have ha sex with whomever we want, whenever we want, wherever we want. So the sexual revolution of the sixties was a huge deal. And there's a lot of details in that, but I, I we don't have time. I'll get into that maybe in an, another episode. Um, but, and then in 1960, the pill was invented basically. Uh, it was approved as a contraceptive in the United States. And that had a dramatic effect. And a man called Riley, I forgot his first name, Riley, uh, wrote a book called Making Gay Okay. It's a really amazing book. I think it came out, I don't know, five, ten years ago. But he talks about the pill and he talks about how the pill, it was the, it was the first time you could cut sex and you could cut the link between sex and diapers so it was not the first time but it was the it was the most uh influential moment when you that link between sex and diapers was just severed and uh so sex again was just for for fun and for satisfaction and then in 1969 the stonewall riots happened the stonewall inn is a gay bar in new york i've been there several times um, and that's, it was in 1969, it was raided in the middle of the night, late at night by police and people were arrested. Gay is a gay men's bar. And, and that sparked basically the gay movement, uh, because the, the following few days after that night, there were riots in New York. And then the following year, there were gay pride marches uh in san francisco los angeles and new york and i think chicago but that's that's why and that happened in june on june 28th 1969 and that's why uh gay pride happens in june and uh it, it takes up an entire month now and not just one day and so the stonewall riots that was a huge turning point because it really propelled the gay movement um and, and then yeah, in 1970 were the first gay pride parades and, and also in the seventies in the 1970s, feminism, the second wave of feminism really took root with Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan. She wrote the feminine mystique and, and that had a huge impact um, there. And it was no longer kind of just equity between men and women. It was more about sort of pitting the sexes against each other, men, like women against men, men against women. And so that had a very destructive effect on not only on the family, but on, on sex and on the idea of sex being 
um, in, you know, expressed within this covenant of marriage. And, and then single mothers were beginning to be celebrated. And I, again, I'm not attacking single mothers. Um, what I, what I'm saying is the, these kinds of, these kinds of, um, things that were celebrated on TV and in movies had a huge impact on the culture. And we're seeing the, the fruit of that today. And so I re- there was the movie Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Um, that was a huge hit in the 70s. And it was her bringing up her son as a single mother. And then just there were so many movies. But One Day at a Time was a sitcom uh, that... Uh, was a, about a single mother raising two daughters and and then obviously I talked about this before Murphy Brown in the 90s Murphy Brown was a played by Candace Bergen and she was a a TV anchor journalist and she decided to have a child uh by herself just kind of out of wedlock and uh that that ca- it caused a huge stir because Dan Quayle, the vice president at the time, commented on it, and it was a huge uh, <laughs> controversy at the time. And then in 1972, there was uh, there's a there was a show, a sitcom called Maud on TV, and it starred B. Arthur. B. Arthur was in the Golden Girls. If you don't know who she is. Um, and B. B. Arthur was, this show was a huge hit. I think it ran for, I don't know how long, like a, almost 10 years, eight to 10 years. But in 1972, there was a two-part episode on Maud about abortion. So Maud, in the, in the episode, she gets pregnant by her husband, but she's 47 years old. And she ha- already has an adult daughter. Um, I forgot her adult daughter's name. But anyway, her she has an adult daughter and Maud doesn't know. She's shocked that she's pregnant and she doesn't know what to do with. Do, she's trying to decide what to do. And so the two part episode is all about abortion, whether or not Maud is going to abort this child. And her daughter, her adult daughter, played by, by Adrian Barbeau, who was a big deal in the 70s and her daughter, the, throughout the entire double episodes, begs her mother. It's 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 so bizarre. Um, <laughs> I wish I could show clips of it, but maybe I can. But she begs her mother to have an abortion, and at one point, at you know, finally she says to her mother, "Mom, it's no big deal. It's not a big deal anymore to have an abortion. It's like going to the dentist." She literally says that. Um, so it's like going to the dentist. Then in 1973, Roe v. Wade, uh, Roe v. Wade passed, and and abortion on demand became the law of the land. 1977, there was a sitcom called Soap, and it was the first sitcom to feature an openly gay character played by Billy Crystal, the comedian Billy Crystal. He used to host the Oscars all the time and stuff. Um. But that was that was a huge turning point because that I remember as a little kid seeing that show and seeing Billy Crystal, you know, his character be uh, come out as gay. And it was kind of like really shocking and kind of. But yeah, it was it was it was um, it was bizarre. And that had a huge impact on culture. This this TV show Soap was a huge hit. And it, again, it ran, I don't know, it ran for many, many seasons, I th- probably eight seasons or more. And then in 1978, Harvey Milk was the first openly gay candidate elected to political office in California. Um, I, I don't know if you remember Harvey Milk. There was a movie about his life called Milk, which was written by a, an old friend of mine, Dustin Lance Black. And uh, Lance, we, I mean, I called him Lance. I don't know where he got Dustin. <laughs> But back in the 90s, we were friends and his name was Lance. And um, uh, but Lance wrote the script and he won an Oscar for that script. And so Harvey Milk was a huge deal because Harvey Milk was basically assassinated. But he 
it was this kind of rival guy that, that hated him who killed him. He shot him. And so Harvey Milk became this kind of gay icon in, in, in the gay world. And, um, and then in 1997, we're going to jump, jump way ahead. Ellen DeGeneres was the star of her own sitcom called Ellen. This was before her talk show. So she was the star of her sitcom and she ends up on the show, I think in the last season, she, uh, it ran for many seasons, but in the last season, Ellen comes out, her character comes out as a lesbian on the show which was a big deal. I knew Ellen DeGeneres was a lesbian for way before she came out. It was just clear that she was. But uh, then after her character came out on the show, Ellen DeGeneres herself in real life came out and she was on the cover of Time Magazine with the, the, uh, the title, Yep, comma, I'm Gay. So she came out, that was a huge deal. And then in 1998, Will and Grace and Sex and the City were both big, big shows on, on uh, TV, on HBO and NBC. And Will and Grace ran, obviously for many, many years, so did Sex and the City. And, but Will and Grace was kind of the first time where it was, you know, two gay guys and their, their girl, their friends, their girlfriends. And it was the, it was this time where the the show was so well done and so well written uh, max muchnick created the show and uh it was so well done that it was like you kind of sympathized and related to you wanted to you you laughed at, at these these gay guys cuz they were so funny and so that had a huge effect on the culture because it's like wait those guys are so hilarious like i you know i want to be their friend so that was a big deal. And Sex in the City obviously was all about these four women and kind of like on their long road to eventual marriage, it was all about them hooking up. It was about hookup culture and kind of them, you know, having one night stands, meeting guys, having sex. Obviously, it's called Sex in the City. And that Sex in the City had a, a really big impact on young women. I remember... I just remember that phenomenon. I mean, in New York and LA, it's just like, I, you could just feel it in the air. Like young women were like, yeah, I can be like a man. I'm just going to go have sex with whomever I want. And I, and, and it became, um, that, that really shifted the culture in a big, big way. In 2003, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, the original one, not the current one. It was called Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, where a group of gay guys, five gay guys, would do makeovers <laughs> on straight men. And so Queer Eye for the Straight Guy uh, was the first time that not only... Because Will and Grace and Sex and the City was mostly watched by gay men or women, but this was the first time that straight guys were watching the show with their girlfriends or their wives and they loved it because they were like, cause they loved who doesn't love a makeover show. And so that I remember when queer, Eye came out in 2003 and I told a friend of mine, a straight friend of mine, uh, I remember telling him like this show is going to change everything because it was the first time it was like, even straight guys were 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 loving watching gay guys do these make makeovers on on straight straight men. So queer eye was a huge turning point in culture, and uh, and then in two thousand five, Brokeback Mountain with Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal was a film directed by Ang Lee, and it was about kind of their uh, their furtive love affair. And, uh, that was a huge, huge hit and critic credit was critically acclaimed and, and it was huge just, uh, with audiences and, and, um, Brokeback Mountain won a bunch of awards. It was nominated for everything, huge, huge movie. So that was a turning point in 2005. And in 2008, as I mentioned before, the movie Milk came out about Harvey Milk. 
And in 2015, same-sex marriage became the law of the land, and it was legal. Same-sex marriage was legalized in all 50 states. So that's kind of like a brief history. It's not. It's not an exhaustive history of the turning points, but it's just kind of ones that came to my mind that are that were very powerful, and we see now the results of that. And um, I, you know, my my old friend. Ryan Murphy, who I've talked about before, who created, you know, Glee and all these shows, he, he creates so much content on Netflix and on FX. Um, he created the impeachment show with, uh, about Monica Lewinsky that was on FX. He created, uh, the prom on Netflix and, uh, so many other shows. I can't think of them right now, but uh, American horror story. But Ryan Murphy got a $300 million deal with Netflix and the New York Times interviewed him and asked him what he was going to do with all that money. And he said, I'm going to use it to to champion LGBTQ heroes and heroines. And just think about that. I mean, that, that's just one person in Hollywood who has tons of money and he's using it to basically blind the culture even more when it comes to sex. And so that, that, I mean, and I, I always talk, I said this last week, I mean, storytelling is so persuasive. It's the most persuasive way to change someone's mind and to change a culture you, is by through storytelling. I mean, that's why movies can really, movies and t- TV now can really change a culture can, can change someone's mind on pretty much anything. So that is powerful. And as I've mentioned before, because of, you know, because of the, the last 60 years of all of this stuff of this indoctrination, we see the bad fruit of it. Now we see the bad fruit of sexual liberation and that be through, you know, broken families, which leads to mental illness, to drug addiction, homelessness, crime, suicide, and so on, porn addiction. And, and again, anything outside of marriage between one man and one woman for life is dangerous. I mean, it's, you could, there's STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, there's unwanted pregnancies, there's emotional, physical, and spiritual harm. I, re, I mean, when I was living as a gay man for all those years, I never really thought of, you know, my sexual encounters as damaging. But after I got saved 12 years ago, I realized how much harm that had on me, just emotional harm. I mean, praise God, there was no physical harm. I didn't get any STDs, but just the the emotional harm and the spiritual harm, it, it was just, it, it just is so, um, so damaging and so destructive. And I didn't realize how much damage was being done. And again, I thought I was sexually liberated, but I was actually in bondage. And I had a lot of friends who died of AIDS. Uh, one of my closest friends from kindergarten died of AIDS. And uh, a, re- a really close friend of mine, she was one of my best, best friends. She had an abortion when she was in college. And it still haunts her to this day. She's not a Christian, but she still celebrates the birthday of of this child every year she kind of like kind of figured out what day the child would have been born and celebrates that day. And so it's just so damaging, you know, it's, we don't think about how going outside of that is, is damaging going outside of God's design for sex. And so, and, and sex now, obviously in our culture is seen as quid pro quo, meaning this for that. So it's very transactional, consumeristic. It's like, I know I said this in my book. It's like, as long as you have good abs and I have a good job, like we're good to go, you know, or whatever. Like it's always based on, it's all conditional. It's, it's like, um, and in the second something, you know, is difficult or goes wrong. It's like, I'm out, I'm out of this relationship. 
And so that's kind of where we are in our culture today. It's, and that's even in the church, the divorce rate is so high because we, because all of this stuff has seeped into our consciousness, whether we know it or not. And so when we feel like, oh, this, you know, I'm not really feeling this anymore. I'm not really in love anymore. So I'm just going to like, I'm going to dip out. (laughs) I'm going to ghost this marriage. So that is where we are today. And also sex before marriage can be really damaging because there was some study done. I, I forgot where I read this, but if two people live together before they get married and they, they think, oh, well, let's just try this out and we're going to eventually get married. So it's OK that we live together. The problem with that is whether you're a believer or not, you kind of know every human knows deep down that it's wrong to sleep with someone outside of marriage. Like it's just kind of built in us uh, because because God put this, his stamp on us. And so what happens is that there's this illicit feeling. There's kind of this excitement because you're doing something wrong. And so once you marry that person after living with them, that excitement goes away, that illicit feeling goes away. And so you long for it and you look for it elsewhere. And that's why there, there's a lot of, you know, adultery that, that leads to adultery and affairs because the person again is yearning for that excitement again. They want that, that rush. So that's just one, one of the many reasons not to have sex before marriage. Um, and, and again, na- marriage is a, this covenant where we can be naked spiritually, physically, and emotionally without fear of rejection. Uh, I think Tim Keller said that once, and it's true. It's like, that's so important um, to have that safety, to have that covenant that is indissoluble and where we can, you know, not have to worry all that. I remember just like... <laughs> In all my relationships, I, you know, I had, I think I had five serious boyfriends in all of them. It was just this constant, not, it wasn't like major anxiety, but it was a kind of low level anxiety of like, you know, if, if I don't do, you know, if I'm not doing well financially or if my body's not in good shape or whatever, like that person's going to have, he's going to cheat on me. or He's going to leave me or there was, there's always this kind of neurotic space. Those kinds of relationships live in. And, and I just, as a thought experiment, I, if every human being, I think I've mentioned this before, if every human being, you know, obeyed the biblical sexual ethic, there would be no STDs, no me too movement, no Harvey Weinstein, no Jeffrey Epstein, no Steens, no one wanted pregnancies, etc. Um, and so God kind of knows what he's doing. Like he knows what he's talking about. He knows when he designed, he created sex. Sex is good, but he created it to be expressed within this covenant between one man and one woman for life. And why did he do that? Did he do it to just be mean or a tyrant or... No, he did it because he wants to protect us from harm. He wants to protect us. And I, I've talked about this before, but I remember my dad, my sisters, when they were in high school, they would sneak out of their window to go see their boyfriends. And my dad at one point nailed their window shut. And it's like, well, okay, that, why did my dad do that? Did he do it just to be a tyrant to my sisters? No, he did it because he loved my sisters. He loved them. He wanted the best for them. He he was concerned about their well-being. He didn't want them to get pregnant. Like so that's how God is. He's a loving father and he wants us to flourish and thrive in this world while we're here. And anything outside again, anything outside of of marriage between one man and one woman for life is destructive and will lead to not it'll, it's the opposite of flourishing. And I look back on my life and I, you know, I, as I've said before, I wish I had listened to God. I wish I had listened to my parents, you know, and because I, you know, I went through so much and I, I just, yeah, I regret a lot of it. I regret a lot of it. And 
and I love that God sets up these boundaries for us. Um, you know, when I became a Christian, I was so happy to finally have boundaries. Be be before I was a Christian, my life was completely boundaryless. It's like, you know, you didn't know what was right or wrong. You would walk, go to a party and be like, oh, I guess that guy, uh, we should sleep together. Why not? It's like, is it right? Is it wrong? Nobody knows. But once I became a Christian, it was like, oh, like finally I have these guardrails and these boundaries and I love them. I love, it makes me feel safe and it makes me feel secure. So I love actually that God sets up these boundaries for marriage. Again, we have to remember we live in a specific time and place in history. And I, I remember, you know, my classmates at Jesuit and Ursuline in Dallas, you know, when we were in, in high school in the 80s, all of my classmates, they all believed that homosexual behavior was wrong. They just did, just by default. That was the default position. And it's interesting now, I see a lot of them and like on social media and they're gay affirming. And, um, and it's like, okay, well, what, what, what happened? How did they change their mind? Well, obviously the culture did. The, the, the last, you know, 30 years has changed their mind, you know, since high school. And the culture has come because of the power of the culture. And I just want to read, this was from an article in on the Gospel Coalition. And I just want to read a few uh, paragraphs of this because it's it's exactly what's happening. The narrative of modern sexual liberation feels compelling to so many because it is based on background beliefs of identity and freedom, which have been deeply instilled in us through cultural institutions for nearly three generations. And then the article goes on. In our culture, quote, sex is for individual fulfillment and self-realization, end quote. This modern view of identity is often called expressive individualism. The idea that deep within are feelings and desires that must be discovered and unlocked and expressed to become a true self. Identity is now found in one's desires, while in the past it was found in one's duties and relationships with God, family, and community. Determining and acting on your sexual desires is considered a key part of that process of becoming an authentic person. And I talked about this before, going back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 1800s authenticity is it's all about authenticity especially in our culture now it's like being who you really are being your true self being authentic um and the, and, and the the next paragraph says slogans such as be true to yourself and live your own truth are repeated in countless ways verbal and nonverbal and sink deep into people's hearts any other view is seen as psychologically repressive and therefore unhealthy and then the last thing I'll, I'll say about this article and what it says is, but the modern self is extremely fragile because it is based on nothing but inward feelings. It is constantly changing from year to year or even month to month. Modern identity requires searching through ever shifting and often contradictory emotions and desires to determine a core self. So I think that's, that's, what that's where we are today in culture it's like we don't we're in a postmodern world we don't know there's no objective truth we don't know our we're constantly being tossed to and fro by the culture and if our if we're not planted on the solid rock of christ we're just going to be thrown all around and that's what's happening and then there's the popular catchphrase of the day love is love which is a tautology, it's total gibberish. Love is love. That doesn't mean anything. You can't define a word by a word, by the same word. Um, and so what is that? What is love of your spouse the same as love of donuts? Is pedophilia love? Is adultery love? Is homosexual behavior love? When you post love is love on social media, you're basically leading people completely astray and to destruction. Because it, it's it's a very pernicious slogan that needs to die. Uh, and here's the real definition of love. Because, you know, Paul, the apostle, gives such a great definition in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, love is patient and kind. 
Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. And this is key. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, i.e. gay pride, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So that's a pretty good definition of love, if I do so say so myself. And we also, you know, don't consider oftentimes the supernatural realm that, you know, Satan is obviously behind all of this kind of cultural upheaval and this this kind of blindness that that we're getting from the culture. And, you know, I, Ryan Murphy doesn't, he's not even aware that he's basically a pawn of Satan. Satan's using him to further blind that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people all over the world. And Paul talks about this in Ephesians 6. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And Peter, the apostle, talks about this as well. In 1 Peter, he says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And so Satan is all about death. Jesus is all about life. He's, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Satan is, is about all death. And I always talk about this. We're never just neutral or kind of stationary. So that's why I always say if you watch Netflix for an hour, you need to read the Bible for an hour because you've just been lied to explicitly or implicitly for an hour. And now you need to have your mind renewed by the truth of the word of God for an hour. And it's true. I mean, when I, I listen to audio Bible a lot, when I'm like, you know, driving or doing dishes or something, uh, and it just, it's just amazing the amount of, I'm just like, whoa, like truth, truth. And, you know, I've read these, these chapters in the Bible. I've read these books in the Bible so many times, but every time I listen to it or read it again, it's just like, whoa, that's amazing truth. And it completely changes my outlook on everything. And, uh, and the third, so the final point is number three, the sufficiency of God's grace concerning sex. Now, Paul, as you know, had a thorn in his flesh in second Corinthians. He says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And that's how I feel. I'm single and celibate. I probably, you know, I don't see myself ever getting married. But God's grace is is enough. It's sufficient. The fact that I'm in the kingdom of God that have, I have eternal life, that I'm a son of the king, that I'm a co, I'm an heir to God, a co-heir with Christ, that's enough. <laughs> His grace is plenty. It's sufficient. So whether if you're single now or if you struggle with same-sex attraction, His grace is enough. It's plenty. So in in this life, you know, as I always say, this life is a vapor. It goes by in two seconds. And, and I always say, you know, I've talked about this. If you kind of imagine Jesus coming back, let's say he's returned, not tonight, because then you just throw a party and, and, you know, whatever, watch, whatever. But if, if you thought, if we knew for a fact, let's say, let's just do a thought experiment again. If we knew for a fact that Jesus was returning in three months or six months, how would that change how we live as Christians? How would that change how we spend our money, how we spend our time, how we evangelize everything? Like how would that change our lives if we knew for a fact he was coming back in three months? Because oftentimes we kind of just have this notion that, oh, you know, I have my whole life ahead of me. I have the next, you know, 60, 50, 40, 80 years, whatever it is in front of me. But that's not the case. We're not promised tomorrow. You could die today. 
Christ could return tonight. Um, so that's just a false, false notion. And, uh, so I, I just encourage, and I'm preaching to myself too. I encourage all of us to live as if Christ were returning really soon, like in a few months, let's live like that. Cause it'll change the way we live. And kind of the, 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 in terms of, of why does God prohibit homosexual sex? I mean, why does there, there's bigger, let's, let's look at meta ideas. Let's look at bigger ideas. Like why did God has, have to send Jesus to die for our sins? Why, why couldn't he just snap his fingers and save everyone, every human? Or why did, why do you have to trust in Christ? Why do you have to put your faith in Christ to be saved? Well, that's just God's sovereignty. It's God's wisdom. And we're finite creatures and we, we may not understand, we don't understand this, but God knows he understands all. And, um, we may not fully understand all of this on the this side of glory, but we can rely on God's wisdom and his words. And we can trust them. We can trust that he knows what's best, even though it may seem arbitrary that, you know, gays can't have sex with each other. You know, that, that may seem arbitrary, but God knows best. And I'm going to get to a possible one possible reason uh, for that. But remember in Proverbs three, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. So when it comes to sex, when it comes to homosexual sex, trust in God. Don't lean on your own. Don't lean on your own understanding and don't lean on the understanding of the culture for sure. Trust in God. And as you remember the book of Job, God, you know, is holding court and he presents Job as a truly righteous man. Satan, the accuser, says that the only reason Job obeys God is because God blesses him with prosperity. And Job's, uh, Satan basically says, let, let Job suffer and then we'll see how righteous he is. And God agrees to let Satan inflict suffering upon Job, but not take his life. And Job loses everything, including his, his children, his animals, his, even his own health. And eventually in the book of Job, Job accuses God of being unjust. And God, I love God's response. God gets really sassy with Job. <laughs> His response is really long in chapter 38 and 39, but I'll just read you one little section. Uh, his response to Job, accusing God of being unjust, God says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? And then after all of that, Job repents. And the ultimate reason for Job's suffering is never revealed. So again, we may not ultimately know, we, we may not know on this earth until glory why you know certain sexual things are, are prohibited or forbidden. But uh, we don't need to know that. I mean, we will possibly will know that when we meet Jesus in glory, but, um, but it doesn't matter for now. All we need to know is that God father, the father knows best that the, God knows what he's doing. And one, so one of the things, um, and I got this from Michael Heiser, one of the reasons why homosexual behavior, I think is a sin uh, is uh, we can look at Genesis 38 and I'll just read this little passage. It says, and Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her. In other words, have sex with her and raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the, the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death 
also. So God put Onan to death for wasting his semen. And why is that important? Well, by the way, it's where we get the word Onanism from. And if you don't know what that word means, you can look it up. Uh, so that's, that's why I think homosexual, homosexual behavior cannot produce life. Just as Onan was wasting his semen and, and basically that led to death, homosexual behavior can never produce life. And this is uh, the heart of why the Bible has such a negative view of homosexuality. It's basically an act of death. And, um, you know, I've, I've said this before, and that we're all born, all humans are born with, with sinful, innate impulses. We all have impulses that are not righteous, but that doesn't mean we act on them. Just be, so, so if you you know, if you believe you're born gay, which is a possibility, we don't know what causes homosexual, uh, desire, but that's a possibility. And, um, I've talked about this before, but there are several possibilities, but that's, if you're, we're all born with innate impulses. And so, um, we don't necessarily act on them just because we have those. And, uh, and remember Jesus was single, Paul was single and, uh, and remember we, our bodies are the temple of God. Um, we literally, the Holy spirit resides in us. I mean, that's pretty profound. It's kind of amazing. And it's, it's hard to even wrap your head around that, that my body is a temple of the living God. The Holy spirit is dwelling in me. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Again, Paul goes back to Genesis. But, the, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So again, our body is the, is the temple of God, which is pretty amazing. And... Homosexual behavior is a distortion. I mean, any sex outside of marriage, premarital sex, extramarital sex, homosexual sex, anything outside of that is a distortion of God's sexual design brought to you by the fall, the fall of mankind. And um, in 2 Timothy, and, and this, I'm going to just read this in terms of the idea that churches are falling for or are becoming gay affirming churches. And, um, and, and Paul warns about this kind of thing in, in second Timothy he says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So we have to heed that warning from Paul. Um, we have to make sure that we're, we're not being taught by pastors or we're not attending churches that are teaching false doctrine and, or especially when it comes to sexuality and homosexuality, we have to, we have to flee from those churches and remember Jesus said, you know, we have to deny ourselves, take up our cross. If we want to be his disciples, we have to deny ourselves and take up our cross to follow him. And I'm just, I want to just close with these words from Jesus in the gospels because they kind of sum everything up. They, they just, they're so powerful. He says, enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy. That leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard. That leads to life. And those who find it are few. So Christians, we have to, 
not only enter the narrow gate, but we have to stay on the narrow road to the celestial city, to the kingdom of God, to until we reach glory. And so I just encourage you to to do that and to um you know to stay in the word of god because the culture is it's gonna and i you know i always say this to young people the culture is going to lie to you for the rest of your natural life it will lie to you and you have to choose are you going to believe the culture or are you going to believe god like which the are you going to believe the word of the culture or the word of god that's the decision you have to make we all have to make that. So I hope that helps. I hope that blesses you. And I will see you next week with JP Moreland on the Becca Cook Show. Thank you.